What we're studying is um, the Pauline epistles. That simply means the letters that Paul wrote. And there are several of them that, that Paul wrote. We started last week uh, on the book of Romans. Now, uh, we're going to go quickly through these things. And by no means are we doing a thorough job. We're hitting highlights. Uh, just What we want to do is just get everybody familiar with the books. That way, um, uh, they're not intimidating or anything like that. If someone says, well, you know, uh, turn to the book of Romans, they go, oh, I, I know what the book of Romans is about. You know, and you can think in your head real quickly, and you actually uh, relax a little bit, and you've got some confidence in the book because uh, you know a little bit uh, something about it. But um, what, we, what we learned last week is that in the book of Romans, there's five major doctrines. Now, I'll, I'll say these things, and they're big words, uh, but uh, when they're broken down, they're very simple. The doctrine of condemnation, the doctrine of justification, the doctrine of sanctification, the doctrine of glorification, the doctrine of consecration. Uh, those are big words there, but they, uh, when you break them down, they're very simple. And what the book of Romans is, as far as the Christian is concerned, the born-again, Bible-believing Christian is concerned, the book of Romans is uh, your foundation book. I mean, that book, the book of Romans, is what most of the doctrines that we believe, that we understand, that we know come from. That's the, that's the foundation. Everything else is built on this. If we can grasp the book of Romans and understand a bit of the book of Romans, then we add the other things onto that, you become a very solid Christian because you simply know things. And last week, we studied the, the, the doctrine of... Con we didn't study, we went over it. We introduced ourselves, basically, to the doctrine of condemnation. Now, um, what, what did that mean? Remember uh, David, when he was uh, um, going off to fight Goliath, and uh, his brothers were irritated with him for being there, um, and uh, uh, he just went, you know, they said, oh, you just want to come here. You just want to watch the battle. That's all you want to do. Uh, and he looked at him and said, wait a minute, you know, is there not a cause? There's a reason for, at that point, there was a reason for the nation of Israel to destroy the Philistines. There was a reason there. And when we look at the book of Romans, when, when we're looking at the doctrine of condemnation, uh, we've got to think as Christians uh, and we look at this book, we got to think, is there not a cause? And when we understand the doctrine of condemnation, which is simply, everyone is condemned. Jesus did not come to this earth to condemn, to condemn anybody. We can't stand in a pulpit and condemn anybody. Uh, what's the reason for that? It's because they're already condemned. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's why it's so important for us, if we as Christians could truly understand the doctrine of condemnation, the fact that everybody out there is, uh, is a sinner in the eyes of God. Everybody out there has fallen short of the glory of God, and, uh, and we realize that the wages of sin is death. If we as Christians could really grasp that, it would give us a drive it would give us a purpose. It would give us the, the realization that we must go out and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not going out there to say, you're, you know, you're a rotten sinner and you're going to burn in hell and uh, you're going to be destroyed and God is going to just destroy you. He's going to send you to a burning, fiery hell forever. That's not our message. Our message is, hey, um, you need to get saved. We've got a God that loves you. We've got a God that gave his only begotten son so that you can get saved. You know, our message, uh, our message is not to condemn the world, but to tell the world how to get saved. That's the doctrine of condemnation. And we looked at that last, uh, we looked at that last week. Let's turn to the book of Romans. Uh, let's just turn to Romans chapter 1. Uh, I don't want to belabor this because there's... Um, but in the book of Romans, uh, you find the doctrine of condemnation. Uh, basically, the layout is from Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Um, that's where you find the, uh, the layout of the doctrine of condemnation. Now, the last verse in that uh, section there, Romans chapter 3, verse 20, says this, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And that's what God is trying to tell us in the doctrine of condemnation. This book was written, the law was written to show us that we can't 
<coughs> we can't reach the standard of God. That's why Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross for us. We can't please God. We can't atone for our sins. God needs perfection, and we don't have perfection, but his son Jesus Christ does. And that's what the whole thing about condemn condemnation is about. The Lord Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross for our sins, being buried, and raising again that third day for our justification. So the doctrine of condemnation is the doctrine that teaches us that all are under sin, and the only way out is through receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. That's the doctrine of condemnation. That's the basic for the uh, the basis for the doctrine of condemnation. Now, as um, depressing as that doctrine might be, because it's certainly depressing when you find out, hey, I'm a sinner. I'm on my way to hell. Uh, the next doctrine here that is is brought forth and for us to look at and for us to understand and study is called the doctrine of justification. So we've got condemnation, which means all under sin. The next doctrine we look at in the book of Romans or learn about in the book of Romans is the doctrine of justification, which means uh, just the opposite of condemnation. Justification means I was condemned, but now I'm justified. And justification tells us how we were justified, why we were justified. And we're going to see that very clearly. We're justified through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look here. Um, the doctrine of condemnation, or justification rather, is, is seen in Romans chapter uh, 3, verses 21 to uh, chapter 5, verse 11. Now in my Bible... I've got those things right in there. I write that right on there. I can look right here and I can see as, as I'm looking at Romans chapter 3 verse, um, uh, verse 21 right here, I've got justification 321 to 511. And that gives me an idea if I'm reading my Bible or studying, that gives me kind of the emphasis of what that, those particular sections are about. And that helps me. Uh, I am by no means a genius. My memory is just about shot. The older I get, the less I remember. So I have to write things down. And it's really helpful when I'm going through here and I'm looking at this. Now, let's take a look. Let's just read a little bit here about the doctrine of justification. Um, I, I want to read a few verses. Verse 21 uh, on down. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God. See, now after condemnation, now he's saying this. But now... The righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is, we're laying out, you know, our news, the news that we tell people, the good news that we tell people is that they can have redemption, that they can have salvation, that they can have forgiveness of sins, all that the same being, uh, that they can have the forgiveness of sins through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is basically uh, a, a, a synopsis of the doctrine of justification. Of course, it goes in through those chapters and verses. Uh, it goes into much detail and much explanation, which we cannot do uh, now, because we're basically doing an overview of the Pauline epistles, not uh, not a uh, verse by verse uh, study. But uh, I think it's good to get an overview, then then ultimately go back and, and really dig in and get deep into the doctrine, get that thing well set into our hearts. But let's take a look at this here. Uh, before Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, what the people had was the law, the Old Testament law. They had the uh, uh, Moses laid out the law, and, and uh, the nation of Israel tried hard to um, keep the law. If they, if they failed in any part of the law, they would sacrifice. And when God would see the blood of bulls and goats, those were the sacrifices, he would uh, cover their sins. That way, if, if someone's sins were covered in the Old Testament, when they died, they would not go to hell. Now, they also would not go to heaven because their sins were covered not taken away. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It can only cover it. So in the Old Testament, when somebody uh, sinned, they broke the law of God. When they sinned, they brought a, a sacrifice to the temple and there was a sacrifice there and their sins were covered. If they died in that situation, they would go, uh, they would not go to heaven, they'd, they'd go to paradise. You find that with rich, uh, 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 the rich man in Lazarus. 
uh, in, in the Bible, you see that the, the rich man died and in hell lifted up his eyes. Where was he at? They were both in what was called hell. One was in the paradise side and the other was in the other side. When uh, someone died under the law and they were covered by the blood of bulls and goats, they went to paradise. They waited for Jesus Christ to die on Calvary's cross and to shed his blood for the remission, to take away sin. That's why when you're born again Christian, when you're saved today, when you die, if you're saved when you die, you go directly to heaven. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. Why is that? Because your sins are taken away. The blood of Jesus has cleansed you completely of your sins and you go to heaven. The Old Testament saints had to wait in basically a holding tank until the blood of Jesus was shed to take away their sins. And that's when God led captivity captive, the Bible says, and took them up into heaven. Uh, well, and, and that's basically all in line with justification. But what I want to look at here is, is a few things. Let me go back to verse 21. Uh, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What does that mean? That uh, the righteousness of God uh, is being manifest and being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, it's kind of interesting here when we're, when we're looking at the law and the prophets. When, you, when the Bible talks about the law and the prophets, uh, what uh, when we get into the Bible and do our Bible studies, we're going to see that they're talking, uh, uh, when they're talking about the law and the prophets, two names come up very clearly in Scripture. And those two names are Moses and Elijah. Moses, of course... When, when you talk about the law, you're connected with Moses. In the Old Testament, Moses wrote the first five books in the Old Testament. Um, and, and when you talk about prophets, you think of Elijah the prophet. Now, why, do, why is he trying to make this so important here? We want to uh, we, we look at a, uh, uh, some scripture here to kind of narrow this thing down so that we can see from Genesis to Revelation that... Uh, the law and the prophets, all of the scripture points directly to Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what we, that's, that's what's important for us to understand when, when we're studying this book, no matter what it is. God wrote, or, uh, you know, God wrote it, yeah, God used, holy men of old wrote the scriptures through the Holy Spirit. So God wrote the Old Testament when he wrote the law and when he had the prophets speak. Everything that they said and everything that they wrote all pointed to Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, let's take a look at, um, oh, where do we want to start? Let's go, uh, let's go to the book, we'll primarily stay here, but let's go to the book of Revelation. I want to look at these Law and the Prophets uh, for a second here. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. I, I just want to show us something here. The, the law and the prophets show up everywhere. The law and the prophets uh, are, are primary directives to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, chapter 11, of course we know what the book of Revelation is. Uh, that's when God is, is pulling out his, pouring out his, his wrath uh, upon a, a people in the world that rejected him. Uh, Revelation, chapter 11 uh, uh, let's see, verse 3. Now let me read verse 1 and 2 just to get into it. Verse 1, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. And there was given me a reed un, uh, uh, like unto a rod, and the angel, the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of, the, uh, of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now look at verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, who are those two witnesses? Uh, there's a lot of uh, varying opinions on who those two witnesses are, but I think very clearly through Scripture, we're going to see that those two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. And the reason that they're so important is because those two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, represent the law and the prophet. And when God is dealing with the world, especially here in the book of Revelation, um, uh, uh, what he has is all of Scripture backing up what he as a righteous and a holy God is doing to this world at this point. 
So uh, well, it's kind of interesting here. Uh, these two people end up getting killed. <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, we'll take kind of a, a quick look at their uh, demise as we look at this. Uh, sometimes in Scripture, God uh, uses types to show us things. So look, look at here, verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. In other words, they're going to be in the tribulation witnessing uh, for God. Verse 4, these are the two olive trees. Now we're going to see where that comes in a little bit. These are the two olive trees <clears throat> excuse me, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now verse 6, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Who did that? Elijah did that. Remember, he prayed, and for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And then he prayed again, and it rained. So we're starting to identify this witness here. We're starting to identify Elijah here. Verse 6, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power, look at this next one, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now, who did that? That was Moses. Moses had the power to smite the earth and to turn the water to blood. In Scripture here, we're starting to identify two men, Moses and Elijah. They will be back. They will be in the tribulation. Uh, and they will represent the law and the prophets, which again point to Jesus Christ. What did Jesus Christ do? His job was to come here uh, and justify us through his blood. So, um, oh, I... You know, there's, let me just read this. this. This is so good, and it's scary. It's horrifying. If, you know, we think that Hollywood has uh, scary movies and stuff. You know where they get their best plots from? They get their best plots from, 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 from the Scripture, from the Word of God. Someone there reads this book, uh, and oftentimes I've got to wonder if it isn't, uh, the, the, the wicked wickedness themselves, they read this book and then they make movies and people are aghast at the fear of what's, oh, how could somebody think of these things? They're in the Bible. Um, look at here. I'm going to show you a few, few things here concerning these two men and what happens to them. Verse, verse 7, there, uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, that's Moses and Elijah, the two prophets, the law and the... Uh, uh, um, the Law and the Prophets, verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, in Scripture, you've got to be very careful to read. When God puts things in here, uh, he doesn't mess around. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't waste time. He doesn't waste words. He puts things in here for us to grasp, to understand, to seek and search to find out what's going on. And uh, we may just read over verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. In other words, uh, there's going to be some dead bodies. These two guys, Moses and Elijah, in the future, in the tribulation, are going to be laying in Jerusalem. Why is that? Verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus Christ crucified? Jerusalem. These cities, that city spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. But the interesting thing here, and we're going to see in the tribulation, the primary means of... <laughs> this is going to get grotesque here, but it's interesting. Um, in the tribulation, the primary means of death is decapitation. Isn't it odd that right now, as we get closer and closer to things... Decapitation is very, um, uh, we see that all the time now with what's going on with our wars. Uh, you didn't hear a whole lot, even though they did that stuff in, in World War II and things like that. But now, primarily, what's our greatest fear? Someone's going to cut our head off. Decapitation. Well, that's going to be the primary means of death in the tribulation. Uh, you know, someone's getting us prepared for that. Now, but what I'm looking at here is verse 8, and they're dead bodies. Why, why, why are words so important? It's, it says they're dead bodies. It doesn't say their heads. Their heads are already cut off. 
This, that's how they died, to get their heads cut off. Verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and, and, they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. So when the, when, during the tribulation, the people rebel, there again, rebel against the law, rebel against the prophets. That's the scripture. That's God that they're rebelling against in the tribulation. And they, they rebel by taking these two people, these two men who represent the law and the prophet. They cut their heads off. They kill them. They leave them in the city for everybody to see. They're saying, look it. Now it's over. Now it's done. There's Moses. There's Elijah. God is finished. That's their thought process. Uh, they should have learned from the resurrection. It doesn't work. Three days later, they get up. Uh, verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three, and a half, three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in the graves. They don't want them in the grave. They want people to see them. Look at there. There they are. Verse 10. And they, shall dwell upon the, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall give gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Isn't that interesting? They are celebrating the fact that these two prophets of God, these two men of God, uh, have been killed, and they're celebrating. Remember when the first uh, uh, attacks took place, how we were angered because the people over uh, in the Middle East were having parties and just shouting and having cake and everything else because America was blown up? Uh, same type of thing right here. These people, when they see the men of God dead, laying there without their heads right there in the city, they rejoice. They have a party. It's party time. Um, uh, that's how far, far away from the word of God, from the understanding of the law, from the understanding of the prophets, from the understanding of the grace of God, that's how far away the world will come during the tribulation. They're that thrilled when God's people are killed. Um, uh, verse 10, and they that dwell upon the earth, I'm not, I'm trying not to preach here. I'm just getting a little bit excited. <laughs> I'm teaching, I'm not preaching. Our pastor's going to do the preaching. I'm, uh, I'm doing the teaching. Verse 10, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall, get, and shall send gifts one to another. I'm going to kind of wonder if it isn't around Christmas time that this takes place. Because these two prophets torment them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon, them, uh, fell upon all them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. What you actually have here is a post-tribulation, or I, and that may not even be correct because the tribulation is not over, but a kind of a post-tribulation rapture, what you have here. God calls them up. Here they are. Can you imagine that? I mean, if I'm correct... There's two dead bodies laying there. One's Moses, one's Elijah. One represents the law, one represents the prophets. That means the, the, the scriptures. Uh, the two dead bodies lay there. The people are having a great celebration because, look, they're dead. It's over. It's gone. You know, we're free. We're finally free from religion. We're free from God. That's what people think freedom is. And that's not freedom. A born-again Bible-believing Christian is free. Um, then the bodies get up. They stand up. I don't know. Can the body stand up without heads? <laughs> they stand up. The body stand up. And God says, come up hither. And boom, they see him raptured right up in front of their eyes. They see him go right up into heaven. Uh, now, let's go back to Malachi. Do you know, uh, Math, or Malachi and Matthew. If you find the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, go back one book, and that's Malachi. I want to show you how this ties in. The doctrine of justification. I want to show you how this ties in. By coincidence, <laughs> and that's sarcasm, <laughs> by coincidence, the last two men mentioned in the Old Testament just happens to be Moses and Elijah. The, uh, uh, in, in Malachi chapter 4, uh, verse 4, it says this, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto you in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet 
before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the, uh, to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So in the last book of the, New, uh, of the Old Testament, we've got Moses and Elijah mentioned, and there's a promise of them coming. Now, uh, just a side note, um, your Old Testament, look at, look at the last word in your Old Testament. Your Old Testament ends with a curse. It says, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The Old Testament ends with a curse. The New Testament, the last word in the book of Revelation is amen. And what they're saying amen to is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So the Old Testament ends in a curse. The New Testament ends in amen. The Lord has redeemed us. So uh, we need to get excited about that. One more thing here on this uh, on, on these two prophets here that, that witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the law, everything written in the law, all the, everything about the law points to Jesus Christ as Savior. Everything about the prophets, they prophesy and point to Jesus Christ. They're prophesying about a day when the Lord Jesus Christ will come, which was about 2,000 years ago, and a day when he would die, be buried, and raised again the third day for our justification. We know we're condemned. We saw that doctrine. The doctrine of justification is that everything in Scripture points to justification through Jesus Christ. Not through a church, not through a, a person, not through an organization, not through, you go through the whole list, not through wealth, not through fame, not through power, but through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All of this points to that. Now, uh, Zechariah chapter 14 did I say 14? I think it meant chapter 4. Zechariah, maybe I don't mean chapter 4. Zechariah 4, yes I do. Zechariah chapter 4. Um, uh, Zechariah is looking at some things. He's seen a vision here. Verse 11. Then answer I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side of the candlestick? He's seeing something here. There's symbolism in the Bible all over. And God defines the symbolism very clearly when we look. Verse 11. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Who are the two anointed ones? Moses and Elijah. The law and the prophets. They point to Jesus Christ for our justification. Now, what's kind of interesting, let's go back to Romans. Oh, boy. We're, we're not even close. Let me make a promise, and then let me qualify that. I don't always keep my promises. <laughs> let me make a promise. You know, the, the book of Revelation, or the book of Romans, is, <coughs> is so important for our foundation and our understanding of Scripture that uh, even if we spend just a little bit more time in the book of Romans, we'll spend much less time in the other books as we go through them and, and hit highlights there. But it's so important for us to understand this. Um, uh, what's kind of interesting here with Moses and Elijah, uh, one on the right hand, one on the left hand, we see in the book of Zechariah. Uh, in, in, in the book of Matthew, um, John and James, two of the uh, apostles, and their mother, <laughs> and their mother go to Jesus. Uh, it's kind of comical in there because it tells us how human these apostles were. And they, they, they've got a mama that wants the best for them, you know. Um, so they go to Jesus and, 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 and they say, Jesus, you know, well, what do you want? You know, okay, you know, what do you want? And they said, and, 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 and their mother says, could you put, you know, in your kingdom, could you have John set on one side of you and on the other side of you, James? Could you have these two, my two sons, one set on one side and one set on the other in your kingdom? And Jesus looked at him and said, you know, uh, you know, told him, you know what, you know, do you think you can do what I've done, the, the, the troubles, the trials that I'm going through, do you think you'll go through them? And they said, yes. And he said, indeed, you will go through and you will suffer. But 
but to set on the right hand and on the left hand is not mine to give. That's prepared for who the Father has given that to. And when we search scripture here, we see that the Father has given the right side and the left side to Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. You've got the law on one side, you've got um, uh, uh, the prophets on the other side, and, and, and you've got the grace of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, right there seated in the middle. And, and so what happens when those two guys and their mother went to, went to Jesus? It said that the other ten of the twelve apostles, the other ten, when they heard that, they were wroth at these people. They were mad at John. They were mad at James. They were mad at, their, at, at his mother. You know, who do you think you are? You know, and, and bottom line is they wanted to be the ones that sat there. What happened in the Old Testament, the, Old, or the New Testament here, Old Testament as well, what happened in the New Testament, the apostles, the people that we, we read about in the New Testament, the people that we read about in the Old Testament are no different than us. They're gonna, the, the apostles uh, were squeamish. They got mad at each other. They got resentful at each other. They got jealous at each other. They're just human, just like us. God took them and used them just like he takes us. And, he's, and he uses us for his kingdom. Yeah. Now, let's go back to this. Um, I wanted to cover three things today. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Uh, I'm, I hope I get justification down to where we understand it. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law. In other words, God is showing us how righteousness comes not by the law, but by Jesus Christ. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed. Uh, in other words, as I've said, the people can see. I can look at the Lord Jesus Christ and I can see the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. And I know that my justification comes through the blood that was shed. Uh, and I do not need the law because I can't. I can't fulfill the law. The law points to Jesus. The prophets speak about Jesus. Um, verse 21 again. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What are we saying here? Justification comes through believing what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross. It's not by following the law. It's not by listening to the prophets. It's by believing what Jesus Christ did. Now, let's, uh, let's look at verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Even to this day, people believe that there is something that you have to do to get to heaven. That's following the law. There's, you have to do this and this. You have to be uh, good. You have to, your good works have to outweigh your bad works. That's not true. Um, when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the only thing that matters is have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? And if you have, the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross completely eliminates your sin in the eyes of God. Jesus takes your sin, gives you his righteousness, and when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus took your sin uh, there. Now, let me... There's a couple other verses. Look at chapter 5, verse 4. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. We're, still, we're almost at the end of the doctrine of justification. Verse 8. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, let's go to verse 11, the last verse in this particular section, which is simply a synopsis of justification, verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The doctrine of justification makes it very clear that our forgiveness of sins, that us going to heaven 
is because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross, not because of anything that we did. I can't say enough pen, penance. I don't even know how to, penance, penance. I cannot say enough penance. Um, I, again, I cannot give enough money in the offering plate. I cannot start enough hospitals to help little burn people. Now that's, that's something that Christians should do. We'll look at that when we get to the doctrine of sanctification. We're set aside for holy use. And uh, uh, there are things that Christians should be doing. We should be doing things like that, but not to get saved, but because we are saved. Now, the doctrine of justification will, um, uh, will just... Uh, it is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what, what, what some will say, uh, salvation is by works plus nothing. In other words, when I, anybody in this room, anybody in this world, anybody who's uh, lived from uh, the time of Jesus Christ to the rapture of the church, anybody in this time period here who asks Jesus Christ to save their soul is going to be forgiven of their sins and be guaranteed a home in heaven. And according to Scripture, it's very clear that... Um, uh, we can know that we're going to heaven. Uh, Romans, or uh, uh, 1 John 5, 13 makes it very clear. These things are in that you might know you have eternal life. The doctrine of justification lets us know without a shadow of a doubt that when we die, we're going to heaven if we're born again, if we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's what the doctrine of justification is about. It tells us how we get saved. It tells us why and how we're going to heaven. The why we're going to heaven is Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross for us. Um, and and uh, that's, that, that's, that's the way we get to heaven. Uh, the, the method there is by asking Jesus Christ to save our souls. Now, the doctrine of justification. Next week, we're going to look at the doctrine of sanctification. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Just a bit of an introduction to the doctrine of sanctification. What is sanctification? Sanctification is when you ask Jesus Christ to save your soul, God sets you aside. God takes you and sets you aside and um, uh, for holy use. As a Christian, as a born-again Christian, when you get saved, um, you're set aside for God's purpose. And, and we may not know that when we first get saved. We may not understand that. When I got saved, I had no concept of anything in this book. I was 25 years old and couldn't name three books in the Bible. And I asked Jesus Christ to save me. I can remember kneeling down on the hardwood floor in my, in my future pastor's room. It wasn't my pastor at that time. I wasn't even saved. Uh, but I knelt down on the hardwood floor in his front room and I asked Jesus Christ to save me. I had no concept of what went on uh, or what was going to go on. Uh, I just knew that I asked Jesus to save me and, and I started uh, thinking a little bit different. I, 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 I wanted to get to church. I wanted to know this book. I wanted to be around Christians. I wanted to talk about the Bible. I didn't know what that was. That was God taking me from the world that I was in and set me over here for his purpose to learn finally his ways and, 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 and the things that he wants me to do. To live a holy Christian life is separate than living a worldly life. You see that very clearly uh, when you look at the world and save people. Now, we've got to close out here. Uh, on justification, are there any questions? Justification is, in God's eyes, just as if I've never sinned. I, right now, although I'm a sinner, and I sin every day, and I'll probably sin when I leave church if I don't sin ten times in church uh, because of my nature. My, my, my nature, my old nature is a sinner. But uh, in God's eyes, because of what Jesus did on Calvary's cross and the fact that I asked him to save me, in God's eyes, when he looks at me, he looks at me just as if I've never sinned. Justification. Just as if I've never sinned. That's how God views 
the born again believer. That's how God views someone who has received his son. Why is that? Because God looks through the filter of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And that blood is what takes care of the sin. That blood is what appeased God's wrath. When God looks through the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross, that blood blots out our sin and God sees perfection. That's why we're going to go to heaven. Not because we are perfect, but when, when God looks at us through the blood of his precious son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we are justified in his eyes. Amen. I guess that's all we have to say then is amen.